Hello, this is Bad Vibes. Today's video is a little bit different than my normal videos, as these videos are from No Sleep on Reddit. Joining me today are my good friends, Slumber Reads and Vidith22, both very underrated channels. So make sure you go check them out and sub to them. Their link will be in the description. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. I worked in security at Disney World, the happiest place on earth. Typically, I wouldn't say where I work, as obviously there are some pretty strict rules and things employees can't put online, but I just don't think I could tell this properly without that context. And honestly, I think this may be it for me anyway with this job. I can't see myself working here any longer now. I've been with the company for 23 years. The first 20, I worked in the parks, nabbing shoplifters, and rounding up people who were drinking too much for the heat. Occasionally there would be a fight to break up, but people usually kept it pretty mild. The heat and walking was getting too much for me the last few years, so I asked to be transferred somewhere else with AC, and the company moved me to one of their resorts. While the working conditions were 110% better as far as the climate and the comfort go, the guest issues were trickier, mainly domestic. I guess the expensive and stress of a vacation got to a lot of people and I'd be called by neighboring rooms because some mom or dad were yelling at each other. I would try to suggest that they would take a nap or go do separate activities for a bit and that would usually calm them down. But none of that is what I'm here for. I've got to get this out while I still have time. Three days ago I got a call from management. Apparently a couple days before that, housekeeping had went to a room that should have been turned over that day. Turnover is when a guest leaves about 11 a.m. and the next guest checks in around 3 p.m. But when housekeeping arrived, all of the guest items were still in the room. Housekeeping made a note of it and moved on. But during the next few days, when they entered the room, everything was still there and untouched. I went to go check it out and sure enough, there was an empty room full of luggage, clothes, snacks, some toys, everything that a family would need on vacation. The manager had already looked up the previous reservation and it was for a family, a dad, mom, and two little kids. I tried calling the phone number that they had given us, but all I got was voicemail. We were all stumped, so I made the call that the housekeeper should clean the room and that we would take all the family's personal items to be held until we got in contact with someone. I went digging into the reservation more. The family arrived five days before housekeeping discovered all their stuff. I found out that the family had paid a parking fee on their vehicle. Description was listed. A quick walk of the parking lots and I easily located their vehicle. So that ruled out that they got in a car accident or them just deciding to leave all their stuff behind. Next, I saw that they had bought a dining plan. This is when a guest prepays for all their food. They're given a certain number of credits to use for meals. This family had only used three credits and the last one was two days after they checked in. It appeared that the day that they arrived, they got here late and probably stayed on the resort. The next day, they used two credits in Epcot. The second park day, they used just one credit at the Magic Kingdom and it was at breakfast time. Now at Disney, there's something called Magic Bands. Magic Bands are worn by guests and they act like a room key, a parking ticket, a credit card, dining reservation payment, and a fast pass, which is a system used to bypass a line. It took some work, but I was finally able to look up this family's fast pass history. The day that they had went to the Magic Kingdom, they had breakfast at a restaurant in the park, rode a couple of rides, and then rode their last ride. It's a small world, around 11 a.m., then nothing. Finally, it was time to bring someone else in on this. I called a co-worker at Magic Kingdom and asked him to pull security footage for It's a Small World at the time they wrote it, and I made my way over there. When I got there, my friend was very confused, almost distraught looking. He showed me what he had found. There's usually a camera in the direction of where rides load and unload. The footage showed me them scanning their bands to use the fast pass for the ride and boarding the ride. The footage on the exit of the ride just showed the other people in the car exiting. They weren't there. Of course we thought the worst, 
Maybe one of the kids had fallen out, and the mom and dad and the other kid had gotten off in the middle of the ride to help, and they all got injured or killed, or stuck in the machinery somewhere. So we shut down the ride. Middle of the damn day, we turned off all the music and turned up all the lights. Me and my buddy walked the ride three times before we called in help. Eventually, there were close to 10 cast members searching, and we didn't find shit except for three cell phones and a hat. I was stumped. I've kept digging for the past couple days, and I'm not sure who to tell what I found to next. I've called the police, and I suppose they're on their way. But the company has a way of covering up things like this, and I decided I can't live on myself if I don't put out some sort of warning. I kept digging into the reservation over the last couple days, and today, and I noticed that they had purchased a memory maker. There are photographers all over the parks, and cameras in a lot of the rides, and with a memory maker, these photos are all free. They automatically get added to each guest's Disney account when the system sees that their picture has been taken, and the system always knows. Everyone's whereabouts are always known with the magic bands. Well, I open up the memory maker photo album, and I swear, there's 732 pictures. The first 30 or so were pretty normal. Epcot, a few rides, in front of the castle, but the rest, the rest were all in its small world. The ride only takes one picture per go around, so it appears as though this family has ridden this ride over 700 times. The first picture was pretty normal. Everyone looked happy. It was a busy day and a full car of guests. The next one is rough to look at. The car is empty except for this little family and they look so darn confused. The next 10 or 15 I can see the dad getting angry and yelling. The mom is holding on to those two kids like her life depended on it and you can see the kids getting increasingly upset, crying, and it goes on and on and on. After 50 or so, it looks like they're trying to get out. In one, the dad is missing. In another, they're all gone. Maybe like they bailed early in the ride and tried to walk out. But in the very next one, they're all right back in the damn car. After around 450 or so, I only see the mom and kids. It's just when I look closely, I can see the dad. Maybe just his body now, slumped down in one of the other seats. It says about 675, there's just the mom and one kid. Another body in another seat. The mom and kid aren't moving anymore. I think that they are still alive. Just damn near catatonic. Looking straight ahead. Pale. And I swear on my fucking life. The dolls are moving or something. In some of these pictures I can tell that they aren't where they should be. I even saw one of the dolls in the car with a family. I can't look anymore. Or I'm going to lose my lunch. I close the album. Its file size has increased since I closed it. God, are there new pictures being added? I see on the security camera that the local PD has just arrived and they'll take over soon. I wish I knew what the fuck was going on, but I also wish this damn thing had never landed on my lap. I don't think I'll be able to update this. After I talk to the police, I'm gonna walk out of here and never come back. I just wanted to get this out there before Disney feeds the media some bullshit cover up as to where the family vanished to. They didn't vanish. I know where they are. Call bank position. No limit to what you can make. Innovative employees call now. Sure, no limit to what I can make at a call bank. Whatever. But I'd done similar work before. Hell, I had done pretty much all work before. I was broke and not picky. So I decided to call the number. Rent was due. My electricity was two weeks from getting cut off, and I needed cash quickly. So I called the number and they said they were having a group interview on Saturday, and it paid $20. I jumped on the bus down there, and wound up taking some weird psychological test. Bizarre stuff. But $20 for two hours sitting in a crummy strip mall, filling out a test wasn't so bad even if I didn't get a call back. But I did. I was barely home when I got a call telling me to show up at 9am on Monday to start work. And to wear a tie. This is where it gets weird. Well, weirder. 
I hop off the bus the next morning and I'm at a really nice building. I've worked at call centers before, and they're always in some cheap, crummy place. Where square footage is cheap. This building is gorgeous. I'm brought up to the floor and shown to my individual office. Not a cubicle. An office. It's nice, and while I don't have a window, I'm definitely not complaining. I'm shown around by an office manager who explains my new job. I'm to call people and ask for some of their time. If they agree, I transfer them to one of the principals. I find the numbers I want to target. Red flags galore at this point. I don't even know what we're selling. And she makes it clear that I just have to get them to agree to give us some of their time. This makes no sense. No product, no call list provided. Paid based on how well I do? Seems like a scam, right? Totally bizarre. Maybe a cult. There are only a few workers, and they just seem to be milling around. Then the principals arrived. Older men and women, but glamorous in an old money way. They just dripped wealth. Their clothes were expertly done. Everything looked incredible. One stopped in front of the office manager and smiled a perfect smile. Mr. Smith, this is our new caller, Caleb. He'll be directing calls to you today. Mr. Smith nodded at me. We're very excited to have you on board, Caleb. His eyes looked strange, almost reptilian. This is the first opening we've had for a while. I'm sure he'll make us proud. After getting introduced to the phone system, I started just dialing random numbers. Finally, I got an older man who laughed when I asked if I could have 15 minutes of his time. Sure thing, son. Don't you have anything else to do today? I quickly put him on hold and dialed Mr. Smith. Who am I speaking to? He asked. Ronald. Retired. Thinks we've got an exciting new product. And how much of his time is he providing us? Fifteen minutes. Thank you, Caleb. Please put him through. Two minutes later, Mr. Smith appeared in my office door. Good job, Caleb. First calls don't often go that well. Now try to find someone willing to give you more time. You'll get paid for how much time you can provide us. Remember, you can call anyone. That was another huge red flag. He couldn't have been on the phone for more than a minute. <laughs> what were we doing here? Things got weirder. I figured I would try a phone sex hotline. If I'm paying, they'd give me as much time as I wanted, right? As it turns out, they would not. I got connected to Destiny, and once I asked if I could have some of her time, she got immediately weird. We told you people not to call here anymore. No, you can't. She hung up. I tried twice more on different lines, and got the same response. I hadn't had much luck when one of the other callers asked if I wanted to eat lunch together in the conference room. There were only three other callers, and I figured I could pump them for information. I tried to bring up every red flag so far, but they all shut down my questions. Mike finally leveled with me. Listen, man. I've got a high school diploma and five kids. I've been here eight years and made $500,000 last year and took plenty of vacation. Stop asking questions. This job is the best thing that'll ever happen to you. Instead of focusing on what we were doing, I asked for tips on who to call. Mike focused on stay-at-home parents he could tell they want a vacation. Carol liked to call empty nesters. Susan checked resume boards and asked people if she could have some of their time to discuss a professional opportunity. They asked what I was doing, and when I said I had tried a few phone sex hotlines, they all laughed. Those stopped working two years ago after they caught on to us, Mike said, though I didn't understand what he meant. After lunch, I got back to it, trying some of what everyone had suggested. I had a bit more luck and finished up with four hours. At the end of the day, I was called into Mr. Smith's office and presented a check for $250. His office was odd, full of weird books old in foreign languages and antiques. There was also a red digital clock on his desk, taking backwards from what looked like just over 600,000 minutes. A good first day, Caleb, he began. Remember, it's not just the time you gather, it's the time you use. Today you spent eight hours here and generated four hours. It's a negative day, but you'll get the hang of it. At exactly five o'clock, the principals, there were ten of them, left their offices and descended into luxury cars. The doors held open by their own drivers. I went to a check cashing place and then bought a prepaid debit card so I could pay my electric bill. The next few weeks went well. I was getting the hang of it and had very few negative days. Each day I was assigned to a new principal, and they all seemed to like me. The other workers relaxed around me too, and my checks grew, soon going over $1,000 a day. I got used to the weirdness. All the offices were full of antiques, with the exception of a digital clock each principal had on their desk. 
counting backwards from some giant number. I had no idea what we sold. It was a weird game to convince people to say they would give me some time. But I didn't care. I paid off my debt. I had an actual bank account that was growing for the first time in years. And I was able to upgrade my wardrobe. Then I had my big break. I had read an article about how the academic job market was so hard. The next day I found a good candidate online, PhD, postdoc, and was posting his CV everywhere he possibly could. The phone was picked up on the first ring. The guy on the other end already reeked of desperation. Hi, this is Tim. I'm calling this morning about an open professor position we have. Can I have some of your time? Sure thing. He was clearly nervous. Um, how much time do you need? Well, I replied, how about the rest of your life? I could hear the thrill in his voice through the phone. Does this mean a tenure track position? Let me get you connected. I put him on hold and dialed Mr. Smith, who picked up immediately. Grad student. Thinks he's got a tenure track position. How much time is he giving us? Mr. Smith asked. I paused. The rest of his life. Good job, Caleb. Put him through. At the end of the day, I was presented with a check for $100,000. The principal said I might set a record for the highest earner. I put a down payment on a condo and moved out of my crappy apartment. When I had another big day two weeks later, I bought a new car so I could drive to work and bought a spot in the expensive garage in our building. My parents visited and I took them out to an expensive dinner. For the first time in years, they didn't think I was a failure. Everything was going great. I had money, my own place, a new car. I got up the confidence to ask out a friend of mine, Amy, and we even started dating. Everything was going well until I went out one night to pick us up a bottle of wine from the corner store to have with dinner. On the newspaper rack was a picture of a young man with a headline, Grad student found dead. I picked it up and saw the name of Tim. He had been found dead in his apartment, and his death was completely mysterious. I read through the article. He had died the day I called him. I called Amy and said I was suddenly feeling sick and I was going to go home. After a sleepless night and a trip to a local store, I had a plan. I arrived at work early the next day and set up a camera in the office of the principal I would be working with for that day, Miss White. It was tiny and discreet, but I could monitor it from my office. When the principals arrived, I said hello to her and retreated to my office where I turned on the recorder. She was in her office with the door shut, reading some book in a language I couldn't understand. Her clock was on her desk and counting down from 754,000 minutes. I made a few calls before I got a hit. A student who jumped at the idea of a two-week all-paid vacation. I transferred him through and then turned back to the recording. Miss White picked up the phone and the smooth words poured from her mouth. Good morning to our big winner. I understand you're willing to give us two weeks of your time. She smiled and hung up the phone suddenly. As she did, I realized the clock on her desk had changed and now had an additional 20,000 minutes on it. The pattern repeated itself throughout the day. I couldn't figure out what was happening. At the end of the day though, suddenly I saw her moving. She picked up her phone even though I hadn't called her and started speaking. Is this Amy? Good afternoon. I'm one of Caleb's bosses. Yes, yes, we're very fond of him too. Listen, we're planning a surprise for him and I need some of your time. Is that okay? Well, I'm not sure. How about I take as much of your time as I need? She laughed. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. She hung up. Her clock jumped again, this time by tens of millions of minutes. She turned towards the camera and looked right into it. You shouldn't have done that, Caleb. I ran to the door of my office, but found it locked from the outside. I pounded on it, and then tried to call 911. But suddenly my cell phone had no service, and my office phone was disconnected. I screamed and kicked at the door. It was hours before I slumped, defeated against the wall. I heard the click and the door swung open to show Mr. Smith. He motioned for me to follow him into his office. When I arrived, I realized his clock, which I hadn't gotten a good look at for a few weeks, was also tens of millions of minutes higher than it had been. You're a natural, Caleb. I stared at the floor as he continued, but you pushed too hard for answers, so we had to show you what we were capable of. We had to make you understand. I glared at him. That grad student is dead. He nodded. So is your girlfriend. We had to make an example. What are you? He smiled. We've been called many things over the years. 
So many names, so many rumors. The truth is this. We are immortal, but we need others to freely give their time to us. In old times, this caused rumor that we had to be invited into a house, that we could not enter freely, but those same rumors also made us seem most unsavory. I spat at him. So we're killing people? That sounds pretty unsavory to me. He sighed. Not very often. Someone will get a phone call and offer two weeks of their life, an hour, a month. When they are older, they will never realize they lost that time. So we hang up and they feel a tiny bit older, though they cannot describe it. I stared at the desk as my world swirled. What do I do? He smiled. You will have a good life. You will come to work and continue to help us get time. You will be handsomely rewarded. You may stop if you like, but you will never speak of this to anyone or there will be consequences. We needed you to understand that. He paused and then took a check out of his desk for $500,000. A bit extra, since I know there was an emotional connection for you today. I took the check as he walked past me. You can have a life people only dream of, Caleb. Your recent work has been exemplary, really pushing the envelope of what we thought was possible. I waited a few minutes before I took the elevator to the lobby and walked out into the night. I felt nothing. It was like my soul had left my body, leaving only emptiness. My life stretched out before me, and I knew how it would look. Full of money, importance, glamour, empty pleasures. I knew I would deposit the check in my pocket into my account. I knew I would be back at work in the morning. What else did I have? What else could I do? Maybe you are hoping for a job, or a vacation, or for your luck to change. Maybe you've been waiting to hear about an exciting new investment opportunity, or you're just lonely and want to spend some time chatting with someone. What I'm asking is, can I have some of your time? It was with a painful recollection that I attempt to tell this tale. Even now, the fever of the mind plagues my psyche and trying to recollect that horrid encounter in that dreadful cabin on that cursed mountain in 1948. Had I been a man of greater foresight, or perhaps a time traveler, I would have warned myself of the grievous travesties my small circle of friends and I were doomed to bring to fruition. My name is Edward Phillips. This is my tale of terror. In the early days of fall, the eastern coast of the United States begins to change. The leaves on the trees shift into a state of beautiful decay, causing the ever-present greenery to descend into a blissful amber, and many a man can be seen gawking in the general upright direction of these sites. Accompanying the intricate differences in fauna comes the drastic shift in climate temperatures that spreads like an icy weed over the coastline and inevitably inward toward the greater United States. The cold, the snow, that dreaded ice giant that stumbles out of the nothing to bring with it a cold so deep and unforgiving that it permeates the countryside far longer than wanted or expected. With such a bleak and even harrowing description of the East Coast, one wonders why a man may choose to live in a place so damn unforgiving. The truth is that the men and women who populate this area of America are of greater resilience than their mother nature, to their mother nature, and are some of the most pleasant individuals one can come across in life, if you'll believe it. They work hard for what they earn and ring true to the image of the ideal American. Many from outside the parameters of this area would insist that the man of the East challenges the great winter giant on a yearly basis, belittling and poking fun at the angry beast that controls his environment. Like a badge of honor, the hardy people of the eastern seaboard take great pride in the innumerable downsides of their habitat, and none, I dare say, are as kind-hearted as the ones who reside in the great state of New Hampshire, where my tale unfolds. New Hampshire compared to a majority of other states, is a dismally small blip on the map, geographically speaking. 
However, if one were to find themselves within the expansion of its mountain ranges, they'd swear the place had no borders, only an endless realm of untamed wilderness and beauty. A frontier of palpable, primordial spectacles. No different from the rest of the state is the town of Franconia, who resides nearest the Echo Lake along the Highway 93, with very little as far as population goes. I was not a denizen of this area, but rather from the neighboring state of Massachusetts, within the small town of Marblehead. My close friend and esteemed colleague of Emerson College, also located in Massachusetts, Daniel Barker, had been birthed in the town of Revere. Daniel, however, was gifted the luxury of both parental figures originally from a wealthy area in Rhode Island, whose names elude me. Daniel had always had a modestly rich family, one who would probably look down upon my company as a man, simply for my choices in clothing and, of course, my wealth, or in this instance, lack thereof. They had always been an uptight lot of people, with serpent-like qualities of character. Daniel was cut from a different slab. He was everything his family was not. To say that was he was a kind, charitable, and above all else, intrepid youth of twenty, with an appreciation for the stillness and serenity of nature. During our studies at Emerson College, we had both found a mutual interest in the confines of books and storytelling to the greatest degree of friendship, despite our social hierarchy being on opposite side of the spectrum. He was a tall, handsome fellow with a square jaw, a barrel chest, strikingly perfect hair, and unmistakable charisma. I myself was a bookish lad of 19 with circular spectacles, combed over brown hair and an average build. While some may say my features are handsome, I will never define myself in such a manner, as I no longer look in the mirror for fear of something looking back at me. Peculiar it was that Daniel and I would become so closely bonded over our time in school together that once a year, for the past three years at least, we would all venture up towards his family's luxurious cabin up in the hills of Cannon Mountain and enjoy the sights, drinking a variety of different ales and liquors and of course, right to our heart's content, without the indignation of outside parties. The festivals occurred much to the chagrin of his mother and father, who swore up and down that myself and our other good friend Henry would corrupt his character. This current year, however, the family was quite adamant about allowing us time together, insisting that we get away for a while. This time we had decided the trip would take place in January, all of us were in concurrence with the notion and planning beginning in early December, but the trip itself only ever lasted three or four days at best. It was of the utmost importance to be prepared for an extended visitation should the weather change for the worse. This time of year, the snow falls heavily and consistently, burying the vast majority of the state in a blanket of fresh and clean crystallized powder. We had ample provisions stashed away in anticipation of our endeavor to the cabin, myself having prepared a large pack with various warm clothes, wool socks, a small box filled with miscellaneous medical supplies in case a member of our three-men party should sustain an unforeseen injury, and of course, a hefty amount of stationary implements for my intended riding. Daniel was a well-prepared lad who had brought a variety of different tools for survival in the great outdoors such as flint, a folding shovel, matches, a barbaric looking survival knife, and of course, a Krag Jorgensen carbine. This cut down Norwegian weapon had been a gift from Daniel's grandfather when he had turned 17, and while I personally had no interest or notion of knowledge towards firearms, it made us all feel safer when alone in the woods, should some bear creature take too close a curiosity with us. Henry, of course, brought with him tools of inebriation. While only a male of twenty himself, he had developed a habitual liking into the bottle. Not so much that I controlled him, but closely enough for people to assume it all the same. Of course, each of us brought a respective pair of snowshoes. The drive was a slow and daunting one. Daniel's automobile, while something neither Henry or myself could dream to afford in the near future, was indeed an advantage. 
It was a treacherous drive riddled with uneasiness and a certain questioning of the mechanical dependency with which we transported ourselves, at least for Henry and myself. Daniel, as always, had maintained his supreme competence and capabilities of mobility, never once called into question his ability to take the icy roads by storm at speeds reasonably less safe than preferred. We parked the automobile in a dirt and snow-covered lot several miles south of our desired location, taken by foot into the hills and ascending into the mountains with gusto. So enthralled I felt by the winter surroundings that lavished the countryside. So carefully placed did the icicles form from the tips of trees. So fresh the air was. So quiet and vast was the land we tread. So foolish I was to allow my friends the fate they would soon be given. After an hour or so of tiresome walking, we came to the cabin, which rested in between a somewhat open-fielded area at the base of one of Cannon Mountain and a thickly forested void. It was a splendid sight to see. Two floors in total were its structure with only two doors, one on either end, and a long window overlapping the entirety of the valley-like landscape before us on one side. That night the chimney plumed with smoke of aged wood prepared and chopped by Daniel a month prior, and the cabin was alight with pleasant conversation between the best of friends. Merriments were had, and stories we all knew and had retold infinite times prior were brought up in their endless cycle of humorous repetition as friends do. That night, I turned in early due to exhaustion from the hike here. As I ascended the immaculate wooden staircase, I peered down to Henry and Daniel, who of course were still going on about their travels and lives, pasts, and futures. Had I known this would be the last night of solace we would all share together, I'd have at least stayed longer than I had. That night, I lay in my small guest bedroom, sitting up and gazing thoughtfully out the circular window at the bluish hue the moon cast upon the frigid wasteland that enveloped us. The trees were like golems of wood in the distance, still and undisturbed by our playful antics. Strangely, in all that vast stillness on the horizon, my eye was caught with the scarcest bit of movement within the far-off tree line. Blinking several times to adjust my eyes, perhaps seeing something that wasn't there, I focused outward again. There it was, slow-moving and large. A misshapen apparition haunted the distance. At the time, I had attempted to rationalize with myself, being a boy of many anxieties in childhood, a hunter, perhaps, a man of the woods who stalked its densities for sport. That had to be it. Just then, as I found myself coming to terms with my conclusion, the bulky anomaly halted. It was said once by my father that a man can feel when he's being watched, regardless of distance, and up until this moment in time, I had thought my father a fool for believing he had such superhuman senses. Yet here I was, feeling as though despite the ludicrous space between us, that this nameless thing had seen me had locked eyes with me and had stared back without the slightest notion of fear. Somewhere down the stairs, a bottle broke, followed by laughter, startling me enough to pull my eyes from the window temporarily. Naturally, when I looked back, I could make out no apparition or strange being gazing menacingly off in the snow somewhere. The only notion of difference now was that the wind had picked up considerably. I laid myself down to rest, and thought no more of it. The next morning, I awoke, relatively early as the sun came up. Walking downstairs quietly to the larger living quarters, I noticed Henry lazily passed out on the old, long sofa that took up the most space in the cabin. Daniel was standing in the doorway, scratching his head. As I approached him to figure out why he looked so perplexed, my sensations were bombarded by the stench of death. I paused momentarily to analyze the scents which viciously overtook my nostrils. Reaching the door, Daniel was staring down at the carcass of some type of animal on the porch. A very young deer, perhaps. 
I had to turn away for a brief interlude, trying not to expel whatever remained in my stomach from the night prior. Daniel stared at the poor creature with remorse and disgust simultaneously. I looked back once more at the amalgamation of dead flesh. It was a sickly sight. The animal's limbs were bent and contorted and disproportionate. Painful and unnatural ways. Its stomach had been spilled by several large slash marks on the visible parts of its belly. The throat flapped and leaked dark blood. The fawn had a variety of misshapen sticks pushed inside its body that its snapped legs were wrapped around and its long, pulpy tongue stuck out of its mouth with a sickly, deep purple. No longer could I hold back. I ran past Daniel and into the snow, releasing my innards and tainting the white with bile. Soon, Henry had stirred and risen to much the same reaction as myself. He and Daniel removed the carcass soon after that, disposing of it in the thickness of woods not far away. That afternoon, the sun began to fall very quickly. The skies grayed within minutes and the wind howled furiously. And the wind howled ferociously. We came to the conclusion that whatever had performed that sickening display of torture could not have been some simple animal. The injuries were too brutal for a simple-minded predator to perform with such needless hate. This had to have been the doing of a man. A cruel man, surely. We decided that it would be best to head back to the vehicle first thing in the morning and return with haste to our respective homes for fear of some further harassment in the form of pointless cruelty. There was no telling of tales that night by the fire, no jostling of humorous intents that we all wanted, only an eerie suspicion that we were being watched from afar, and while any man could attest that no living human could survive the blizzard outside and live to tell the tale, I had a feeling in my gut that it was something beyond human that circled our cabin like prey. As we all drifted into uncomfortable sleep that night by the dying fire, uneasiness spread over us like a cancer. A dream came to me that night, one of great looming fear. Out in the cold distance, beneath the trees, I could see eyes. No ordinary eyes of man were these. They were a sickening red that had a dull lifelessness about them, a stare of foreboding utterances and dark promises. It knew I was scared, and it welcomed the idea, relished it even. This apparition sat motionless, cloaked in the shadow of the trees. Behind it, more eyes similar to the first opened up. A cluster of hateful and predatory vision cast itself at me, on me, into me. I could hear strange whispers in the dark of no known language, as if some ancient tongue shared between these faceless monstrosities was speaking and planning, but of what I know not. The feeling of being watched by some hateful pack of things lasted far longer in dream than I'd ever known a dream to last. As I felt I would spend an eternity locked in gaze with these creatures, a violent scream tore me from my mental prison. Henry, who was thrashing on the couch next to Daniel, had begun wailing in pain and fear. Both Daniel and I had sprung up immediately in confusion to try and awake him from his nightmare, only to find the normally quite skinny and frail lad to be overwhelmingly strong in his erratic movements. He began to shout, They're coming! They're coming! They're coming! He shouted, Daniel and I were both attempting to keep our composure, but managed to restrain our friend and shake him awake after the better part of five minutes had passed. When he finally awoke, he broke down into tears. We had little to offer him as far as comfort went, as Daniel and I found ourselves lost in a sense of directionless fear. When questioned as to what happened, he spoke of a vivid dream, or better nightmare, that he was trapped in for some amount of time. He went on about the hounds of the hills, the things he saw attempt to take him in his mind. It all made very little sense to us, until he had mentioned something about the eyes in the distance, to which I found a sense of icy recollection wash over me. 
Henry and I had experienced something of a similar experience, except his was far more long-lasting and detailed. Daniel's complexion had been made pale by our friend's ramblings, and as we both went into the small kitchen to get Henry something to drink, I questioned him about if he had a similar dream. We were left dumbfounded when we both came to the realization that all three of us had shared a similar night terror. That simply did not happen. Apparently my experience had been the least harrowing of the three of us, with mine only reaching climax at the beginning of Daniel's ordeal, which apparently had lasted hours, which begins to question just how long Henry was trapped in his own mind. Daniel was feeling a bit ill-weathered, and I had noticed his hair looked longer and out of place, perhaps the result of his frightful sleep escapade. Upon return, Henry was curled up in the corner of the room, rambling on and on about the primordial pack who sought new flesh for their growing family. The dogmen of the mountain, who had been here long before the world of man. The ones who had terrorized the Native Americans, who had lived within the mountain for eons until they desired new blood. Who had called those unfortunate enough to hear their dream howls. At once I felt a mixture of emotions stirring in my mind. I simultaneously found myself pitying poor Henry for having such horrid visions forced into his gulliver. And yet, a sense of relief that I had not been as unfortunate as him. He would not take the glass of water. He would not hear anything we said. He was not even here. Just as we were preparing to set Henry back to sleep on the couch, a powerful thud landed on the front door. Then another. And then another. The third accompanied by a horrifying noise. So inhuman and evil was the gurgle below that I found myself sweating at a sicilic rate. Backing away from the door, Henry had begun to clutch his temples and open his mouth as though he were screaming, but no noise escaped him. Daniel quickly retrieved and loaded his rifle, pointing it at the door. I had no weapon what to defend myself with. What felt like hours passed, Henry was still mumbling something to himself. Don't fall asleep, Daniel, he said. That's how they turn you. Don't fall asleep. They want you, Daniel. I rushed over and plugged Henry's mouth with my hand for fear of Daniel shooting him. His madness had truly driven him to a deep insanity. But there was no denying I felt the urge to heed his words. By the time Daniel had lowered his rifle, it was somewhere around one in the morning, and we were suddenly feeling a wave of exhaustion. The wind still echoed eerily in the distance outside. My mind swirled with possibilities, and the faint possibility of our death was approaching, and yet I found my eyelids curiously heavy. Daniel was resting his back against the fireplace, which now housed only hot embers. I attempted to keep Henry awake, as I noticed he had already drifted to sleep, his lips still chattering wordlessly. Shaking him did no good. Slapping him had no effect. I turned to Daniel. If we were going to come out of this, the person with the gun would be the best one to remain sane. I crawled over to him with great effort, trying so hard not to pass out. My limbs held the weight of someone three times my size. Daniel had begun to flutter at the eyelids, and as I found myself too weak to reach him, I lay my face down, catching a glimpse of something watching me in the window as my eyes shut on their own. My screams internalized, due to the helpless state my physical body had been left in. I dreamed again, drifting through the endless mire of the mind. Now the eyes in the distance became clearer. The misshapen denizens of the mountain took a step out of the darkness, perhaps finally piercing the last metal barrier that held them back, and approached our sanctum of the cabin. Slowly they came. Some walked upright and dignified, others on all fours more akin to the beasts they looked like. They were not always proportionate, and were in some areas sickly thin, while others muscular and strapping. The darkness still shrouded them almost entirely, making features hard to distinguish with exception to the large ears and hellish red eyes, transfixed on myself and my friends, who were staring motionlessly out in the front of the porch unable to move our bodies in the slightest. They were everywhere, 
and from all angles. The closer they came through the howling wind and snow, the more I found myself growing colder and colder. The pale moon, somehow shining its light upon the beasts, made only worse our situation, as blindness would have been preferred to watching your doom encroach. Just before the pact closed in completely, outstretched her clawed hand and exposed a set of jagged sharp teeth from a mouth so unnaturally wide. I awoke. I was back in the guest bedroom. At once I threw myself out of the comfort of my bed and looked out the window. Nothing. Not even the wind. But I was not convinced. There was no possible dream so vivid as this. So deep with memory and detail unless I was still asleep. I'm not sure to this day what was a dream and what was not. I cautiously walked down the stairs, praying for some form of relief in the sight of my friends, hoping against hope that they were of sound mind and body. Henry lay motionless on the couch in sleep. The rifle rest against the fireplace. The door was partially open. Daniel was nowhere to be seen, Hurriedly, I rushed over to shut the door to separate ourselves from the frozen hellscape. I walked over to the other side of the cabin, where the largest window was, and attempted to pour myself a glass of water from the small kitchen. It was a much welcomed drink. I gaze out of the large glass window, feeling a sense of what I hesitated to call relief. There were still many questions to be answered, most prominent of them all was our friend Daniel's whereabouts. The only logical explanation was that Daniel had awoken before myself and Henry and decided to put us both to sleep in our respective beds. That was just like him, a kind man even in such a dismal, bleak scenario, but where was he? A large, clawed hand slapped against the thick glass of the cabin window, causing me to jump back, raising itself to level with my vision. My greatest fear was made reality. The eyes and teeth of the dream beast had focused on me yet again. This time, I finally got a look at the thing, though in all my mind I wish I hadn't. It was a hideous, primeval creature. Its skin was a dark, oily blue, with even darker blue patches of long, mangy hair. Its large ears were canine in nature, but not like that of a lichen of myth, but something more unnatural and gut-wrenching. Its flat face exhibited small nasal passages, and it carried with it a sickly smile on its outstretched maw. Many of them began to appear on the window, slamming their powerful hands against the glass in anger and hateful frustration. The now wavering, cracked glass was the only thing separating my frail mortal body from these ancient monstrosities. They growled and gurgled and howled into the night, as the glass was soon to give way. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and I made back to the living room where Henry was still asleep. I attempted to wake him in vain yet again, only for the front door to fly off its hinges. It was Daniel, or at least what had become of Daniel. His arms were stretched out thin and long, covered in tufts, covered in tufts of bluish hair, with hands ending in long-nailed fingers. His mouth was not his. The jaw of my friend was now unhinged and stretched downward, in a sickening display of dripping, boiling salivation and rows upon rows of strong, sharp teeth. His shirt was torn and tattered, and his shoes were absent. Daniel attempted to writhe and stumble forward towards us, gripping at his temple with one hand and stretching out the other in a grabbing gesture, as if half his mind were fighting the other half to retain his humanity. I called out to him, pleading with him to resist, to stop. He did not. He lurched forward, eyes disapprovingly twitching involuntarily. One sat and somber, one sad and somber, the other sunken, red, and straining forward with an indescribable pain. 
A crack pierced the air, and Daniel dropped to the floor, blood oozing from a silver dollar-sized hole in his skull. To my shock, I turned to see Henry, brandishing our friend's rifle and twitching uncontrollably. He turned the rifle towards me in a fit of frightened retaliation should I have met a similar fate as Daniel. I had not. We stared at each other for a brief interlude as he lowered the gun. They got him, Edward. They got him. They wanted him. I'm sorry. He spoke in such a somber tone, racked with guilt for his murderous deeds. He began to cry. I'm, I'm sorry too, Henry. I said somberly. The glass in the kitchen finally gave way, much to our surprise. From within the cramped kitchen now scrambled a horrific thrashing mess of the predatory assailants, surely coming to either eviscerate us, or worse, turn us into one of them. Henry fired another shot into the kitchen. Run, Edward. For God's sakes, run for the car. Henry screamed at me as he continued to fire into the mound of hellish beast men. I didn't hesitate, and for this reason alone, I consider myself a coward. I turned and ran out the front door, only for Daniel to grab at my leg. Somewhere, still alive after a bullet through the cranium. His touch was one of icy, hellish hands that sent a splintering pain into my body. With a knife in hand, I slashed at his hand in a fury of strikes, screaming, nearly severing my former friend at the wrist and rushing out into the blizzard. Behind me, the unnatural wailing of hate and bellowing of monstrosities was matched with the ever-prevalent gunshot. As I faded into the blinding snow and headed down the mountain through the moonlit darkness, the sounds of Henry firing the rifle faded into nothingness. I ran for what must have been hours, aimless and lost, in a northeastern blizzard without so much as a jacket to prevent my ultimate demise, without so much as a jacket to prevent my untimely demise. From behind me, the echoes of the dogmen filled the night. They were after me for sure. It was only when I reached the road of unspecified origin that a passing policeman had found me. I was a hypothermia riddled, pale ghost of a man clutching a bloody knife in a snowstorm, rambling about monsters and the death of my friends. When I was finally subdued and brought into hospital care, I was questioned by the police about what had transpired on the mountainside. The tale I told, this one, was enough to land me within the psychiatric ward of Greater Massachusetts. The trial for my friend's disappearance and subsequent murder, which I felt, which I fear I will most certainly be found guilty for, takes place in the following weeks. The police returns to the cabin several days later, only to find it completely empty albeit with signs of a struggle and broken glass littering the ground. Sitting in my padded cell, I hesitate to sleep for fear of what I may become. I have been disowned by my family for my madness and ostracized by society, but I know. I know what lurks out in the wilderness, and I know that I will never be free of the image of that thing that plagues my mind. What purpose they serve eludes me. They are beyond me or your understanding. Their motives are their own. I will always fear them for the remainder of my days. Those ancient evil earth devils. Those hateful, unnatural things. The hounds of the hills. The eyes in the distance. The dogmen of Cannon Mountain.